the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And today we're going to conclude the chapter by looking at the final 10 verses, verses 30 uh, through verse 40. As you well know, last week we were all faced with a penetrating question. And that question was, how do you want to be remembered? What is the legacy that you want to leave behind? And while our legacies are going to be viewed from many vantage points, we saw that at the end of the day, only three really matter. Uh, How your children remember you, how your church remembers you, and how your God remembers you. And we learned that the greatest legacy one can leave behind is a legacy of faith. And we saw that a legacy of faith requires three things. First, you've got to be willing to pass the promises of God to the next generation. Whether or not the next generation will be blessed depends on you. It depends on this generation. And whether or not we're willing to do whatever it takes to pass God's promises, to pass his word down to our children and our children's children. And unfortunately, in the days to come, it's going to require each of us to stand fearlessly in the face of adversity. And I think that's becoming more and more apparent as time passes. If the next generation is going to know God or even know of God, we must do whatever it takes to pass the promises of God down to our children. Secondly, in order to leave a legacy of faith, you must choose the people of God over the pleasures of sin. And that's a difficult choice. As we all know, sin is fun. It feeds our pride. It satisfies our desires. It offers us pleasure. Things that the people of God rarely do. I mean, let's be honest. But if you want to be remembered, truly remembered, you will choose to walk and suffer with the people of God over the pleasures of sin. That's a legacy worth remembering. And finally, in order to leave a legacy of faith, you must choose to live a life that honors God. And we learn that living a life that honors God requires three things. First, it requires you to put Jesus first, put Christ first. Secondly, it requires you to forsake the world. And finally, it requires you to follow God's plan. If you do those three things, you will live a life That is honored God. This is what it takes to leave a legacy of faith. So in recent weeks, we've looked at a legacy of faith. We've looked at a life of faith. And today we're going to look at the courage of faith. The courage of faith. Yes, faith takes courage. And that is what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us here in the concluding verses of the chapter. The courage of faith. So let's just jump right in and begin reading in verse 30. We're told, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in the fight, turned to flight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection." And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were, so, they were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you here today, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for your presence. And Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to our hearts today through your word, 
Father God, I pray that you'd give us the courage uh, to live a life of faith. Lord, open our minds, open our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll just forgive me of my sin, my shortcomings. Lord, as I stand in the gap, Lord, I don't want anything to come between you and your people this morning. Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, to begin with this morning, the Lord would have us to see that faith has the courage to look foolish. It has the courage to look foolish. Look at what we're told in verse 30. We're told, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Now, you all know the account of the fall of Jericho there in Joshua chapter 6. See, the city of Jericho was the first obstacle that the children of Israel faced after they entered the promised land. We're told that this city was well fortified with a wall that completely surrounded it. During this time in history, oftentimes the walls encompassing a a city were wide enough to allow two chariots to pass at any given time. The walls of the city were high and, and they were wide. They were thick. And they were high and thick because the walls of the city served as the last line of defense in the event of an invasion. And upon the arrival of the children of Israel, the Bible says the city was completely sealed off. Nobody could go into or go out of the city of Jericho. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you this city. And if you're going to take it, this is what you must do. The Lord said, I want the children of Israel to march around the city once a day for six days. I want all the armed men out front. And behind them, I want the priest, seven priests, each carrying a trumpet. And behind them, you will carry the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolizes my presence. And then behind them, the Lord says, I want another platoon of soldiers taking up the rear. And we read how the nation of Israel did this once a day for six days. And as they did so, not a word was spoken by the people. They were absolutely silent as the Lord had commanded. All you could hear was the sound of these seven trumpets blasting continually as they circled the city those six days. And the Bible says on the seventh day, the nation of Israel marched around the city seven times. And when the priests made that final loud blast with their trumpets, and when the people shouted, the Bible says the walls of the city fell down flat. See, what the people in the city of Jericho failed to understand was that the sound of the trumpets signified the coming of the Lord. And the Lord was coming to fight on behalf of the nation of Israel. An absolutely astonishing account. But let me ask you this this morning. What do you suppose the people in the city of Jericho were thinking as they watched this spectacle take place every day? What do you think they were thinking? I can tell you what they were thinking. How foolish is this? How foolish is this? And that's what anyone would have thought. That's what some of you are thinking right now as I I read that story to you, that account. How foolish do you have to be to believe that story? But understand this, true, genuine faith has the courage to look foolish. It has the courage to look foolish despite what the world says or thinks or does. And we see that true time and time again in the scriptures. We see it with Gideon. The Bible says he was facing an enemy that couldn't be numbered. The enemy was as numerous as the locust. The Bible says the enemy was as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Yet in the face of this great enemy, God commanded Gideon to reduce his army from 32,000 men down to 300. And Gideon did so. He had the courage to look foolish. And what was the result? Nothing less than victory. Victory. We see it with David as he stood before Goliath with nothing more than a slingshot and a few pebbles. Both sides were laughing at him. The enemy as well as his own people, his own brothers were laughing at him. But David had courage. The courage to look foolish. And look at what God did in his life starting on that day. Look at what God did. Think about John the Baptist. I mean, was there ever one that looked more foolish than him? Walking around in camel's hair and a leather belt, 
eating honey and locusts, preaching the gospel. Everything he did looked foolish. Yet Jesus says, this is the greatest man who ever walked the earth, John the Baptist. That's not what the world would have said. Faith has the courage to look foolish this morning. It has that courage. In the eyes of the world, we look foolish as believers, don't we? We look foolish. The world says it's foolishness to repent of your sin. It's foolishness to stand publicly and profess Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's foolishness to believe God's Word in our day and time. How foolish do you have to be? It's foolishness to run from sin and try to live a holy life. But know this, I would rather look foolish in the eyes of the world than be a fool in the eyes of God. That's where I'm going to stand, and you can make your choice. Faith has the courage to look foolish. Don't forget that truth. Don't forget that truth. Secondly, faith has the courage to stand alone. It has the courage to stand alone. We're told in verse 31, By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies with peace. Now, as you all know, before Joshua took the city of Jericho, he sent out spies to assess the situation. And these spies ended up at Rahab's house there within the city. And we're told that when the king found out, he sent men to take them into custody. But Rahab had hid them on a roof. And as the soldiers of Jericho were were out looking for them, she went to those spies and said this in Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. She says, I know, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that your terror has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts didn't melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. What an incredible statement by this woman. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. And she says, now therefore I pray you. Swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token, and that when you invade, you will save my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the spies answered her, Our life for yours. So here we have Rahab, a prostitute. But that's not what she's remembered for. Look at that. She's remembered for her faith. Here she is. Remembered for her faith. And I think this should be an encouragement to any of you who are battling your past. That it doesn't matter your past. That if you put your faith in God, that's how you're going to be remembered. For your faith. Okay? Out of all the people in Jericho... Rahab was the only one who recognized God for who he is. The God of heaven above and the earth below. She had heard the story. She had heard how the Lord had parted the Red Sea. How he had defeated the Amorites. She had heard everything about the Lord and she believed. And her faith was so strong that she had the courage to stand by by herself, to stand alone. She had the courage to defy her king and do what was right and hide these spies. And because of her faith, because of her courage, when the city of Jericho fell, Rahab and all of her family was the only ones who were spared. They were the only ones who lived through it. And did you know this morning that Jesus' lineage actually passes through Rahab the prostitute? Because of her incredible faith. One woman's courage... To stand alone resulted in the salvation of her entire family. Entire family salvation. That's what faith does. It has the courage to stand alone. Thirdly this morning, faith has the courage to fight the good fight. To fight the good fight. The Holy Spirit says in verse 32, What more shall I say? 
time will not allow me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of David and Samuel and all the other prophets. The Holy Spirit says, I could keep going, but time will not allow me to look at the faith of all these heroes. But God says, know this, know this. They had the courage to fight the good fight. And look at the results. He says in verse 33 that through faith they conquered kingdoms. They conquered kingdoms. And not only did they conquer kingdoms, but they did it with righteousness. As they conquered kingdoms, they they could have used their power and position for evil. Yet they chose not to. They chose to do what was right. And that was proven by their character. It was proven by the lives that they lived. By who they were and what they did when no one else was looking. These heroes of the faith walked with integrity. They did what was right in the eyes of God. They lived a life that far exceeded the world's standards. We need a few more heroes like that in our day and time. A few more heroes like that. Not the heroes of Hollywood or sports stars. We need heroes of the faith. And as they fought the good fight, we're told that they actually obtained the promises of God. The heroes mentioned here within this chapter obtained two of the three promises that God had made to Abraham. They possessed the promised land, and they witnessed the rise of a great nation. But that's not all. The Bible says these heroes saw everything that God promised come to pass. We're told in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Not one promise failed. They all came to pass. And they all came to pass because God was with them as they fought the good fight. We're told that because of their incredible faith, they stopped the mouths of lions. Think about that. They stopped the literal mouths of lions. We read how Daniel spent the whole night in the lion's den. And when the king came to him the next morning, he cried out, Daniel, was your God able to save you? Was your God able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel responded by saying, Oh, king, my God sent an angel and shut the mouths of the lions last night. And they have not harmed me because I'm found innocent in his eyes. The mouths of lions, literal lions, were shut. And in the same breath, there's no doubt that the mouths of those who spoke against these great heroes were also shut. See, when you're fighting the good fight and doing God's work and trying to walk with integrity and living a righteous life and and serving God, the lines will circle. The lines will circle. Make no mistake, they'll talk about you. They'll try to ruin your good character. But ultimately, God will shut their mouth. God will shut their mouth. So be careful this morning if you're smearing the name of a brother or sister in Christ. Be careful. Because God's going to shut your mouth one day. He'll shut your mouth. We're told in verse 34 that these heroes quenched raging fires. We read how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were thrown into the raging furnace. You know the story. The Bible says it was so hot that the men who threw them in died in an instant. And as Nebuchadnezzar anticipated the death of God's anointed, we're told in Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and, and spoke and said unto his counselors, didn't we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto him, That's true, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men. And they're loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and, they've not, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. He's in the fire. He's in the fire. Raging fires quenched because these heroes had the courage to fight the good fight. They refused to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's idol. We're told in verse 34 that these heroes were made strong in weakness. The weaker they were, the stronger they got. 
And Paul testifies to that truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I know that that statement seems to contradict itself. How can a man be strong when he is weak? But it has proven itself time and time again in my life. When I preach the strongest is when I stand before you the weakest. When I'm completely exhausted is when I preach the strongest because I'm emptied of myself and God's filling me from within. And not only were these heroes made strong in weakness, but we're told in verse 34 that they, that they actually became stronger during the fight. Have you ever seen that in the life of, of somebody? The tougher things get, the, the longer the fight, the stronger they get. The stronger they get. That's God's power just flowing through their veins. And you can't do nothing with it. You can't do nothing with it. And when the enemy sees that, he just runs away in defeat. That's what we're told here in our text. They just, the armies just run away in defeat. It takes courage to fight the good fight. It takes courage to do what God is calling you to do this morning. It takes courage. If you do it, the impossible becomes possible. The impossible becomes possible. Faith has the courage to fight the good fight. Have courage this morning. Fourthly, faith has the courage to continue in the midst of suffering. And we touched on this truth last week, and I'm not going to belabor the point this morning, but following Jesus involves suffering. There's no escaping that truth. You're going to suffer. Like us, these heroes of the faith lost loved ones. We're told at the beginning of verse 35 that some of the women received their dead, raised to life again. And while that's an incredible truth which testifies to the power of God, we know that that's only occurred just a few times in the history of the world. Just a few times. Elijah and Elisha both raised children from the dead. And so did Christ. But in every instance, before the resurrection, there was suffering. There was suffering. But faith has the courage to endure it. Faith has the courage to endure the loss of loved ones. We're also told that these heroes of the faith suffered physical abuse. We're told here in our text that they were tortured. The Greek word here implies that they were spread out on this round torture device and just beat until they died. They were scourged, whipped to death. They were stoned. They suffered emotional abuse. They were mocked for their faith, the Bible says. Mocked. Many were imprisoned, isolated from their families and loved ones in shackles and chains because all they did was what was right. That's all they did wrong. Some were sawn into pieces. Those who were there that witnessed Isaiah's death said he didn't yell. He didn't cry. All they could see was his mouth, his lips praying as they cut him in half with a wood saw. Imagine that. The prophet Isaiah. Some of the heroes were killed by the sword. And oftentimes as these heroes were being tortured, the Bible tells us here they were tempted tempted to recant their faith in order to escape certain death. And these heroes didn't look, much from the, look like much from the world's perspective. We're told in verse 38, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins. They were destitute, afflicted, mistreated. They wandered about in deserts and in mountains, dens and caves. They didn't have a home. The world drove them out. The world drove them out thinking they were unworthy to live in it. But the truth is the world is unworthy of having people like this. God says here in verse 38, the world's not worthy of these believers. Imagine that. Standing before God one day and him saying, the world wasn't worthy of you. The world wasn't worthy of you. It takes courage. To fight the good fight. 
But oftentimes it takes more courage to hold on than it does to fight on. It takes more courage to hang on to the end than it does to fight through the process. Faith has courage to continue despite the suffering. And finally this morning, faith has the courage to count on God's salvation. We're told in verses 39 and 40, all these who have obtained a good report through faith receive not the promise. Since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Here we're told that all these heroes of the faith received God's uh, approval. They received a good report. But there's one thing they didn't receive according to verse 39. And that was the promise of the Messiah. They didn't live long enough to see the coming of Christ Jesus. He is that better thing that is spoken of in verse 40. See, for us, Christ has already been provided. Okay? He's already been provided. But for these heroes, he was yet to come. He was yet to come. But despite that, they still believed. It's like this. We look at the past. As believers today, we look at the past and, and we believe that the Christ and the sacrifice he made on Calvary's hill. But for these heroes, they had to look to the future. They had to look to the future arrival of Christ and the sacrifice he would make on Calvary's hill. Our salvation is based on what Christ has already done. Their salvation was based on what Christ would do. Salvation's never changed. It's always taken faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter what aspect in history you live in. It takes faith in Christ. It's the reason Jesus says to Thomas in John chapter 20, verse 29, Thomas, you believe in me because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Jesus says, blessed are the heroes of the past who never saw me but looked to the future and believed. Jesus says, blessed are the, the heroes of the future who look to the past and believe in the sacrifice I made at Calvary. Faith has the courage to count on God's salvation, regardless of what point in history you may live. So this morning I ask you this. This is the question. Do you have the courage it takes? Do you have the courage it takes this morning? Do you have the courage to look foolish in the eyes of God or in the eyes of the world? Do you have the courage to, to stand on your own and risk it all? To fight the good fight? Do you have the courage this morning to continue on despite the suffering? Do you have the courage today to count on God's salvation? Do you have that courage? I pray this morning that we all have the courage it takes to be a hero of the faith. That's what I pray for you. That you have the courage it takes to be a hero of the faith. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today. And we thank you for this this chapter in the Bible, Lord, that has encouraged us and, and challenged us in the same breath. And Lord, I pray that we would have the courage it takes to stand in this world, to look foolish, to stand alone, to fight the good fight, to suffer, to count on your promises. Lord, I pray that when it's all said and done and when you write that Third Testament, Lord, that many people under the sound of my voice will be found in that great faith chapter. Lord, that they live with courage. Lord, help us to do that. Father God, I just thank you for each person under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray that you would be an encouragement to them and give them the courage they need to fight whatever giants they may be facing. Lord, let them put it in your hands this morning, Lord, I pray. Amen. I want to ask that we stand. Uh, we're going to have a song of invitation. This is your time, and I can't think of a better song for the invitation than what 
Uh, Don's going to be singing here this morning. Listen to the words. And if I can pray with you, why don't you come and let me pray with you?